We are live with Alexander Mekudis, and we are very honored to have a man that probably doesn't need any introductions, but I will introduce Mr. David Sachs with Craft Ventures, and at least for this show, one of the best political and geopolitical analysts out there. If you are not following David on Twitter, Twitter X, definitely follow David on Twitter X because he puts out some of the best commentary on politics, on geopolitics. And uh, David, thank you very, very much for joining us on the Duran today. Well, thank, thanks for having me. That's high praise from you guys. I think I learn a lot from watching your pod. So, uh, you know, you guys are the kind of the top of the influencer food chain, and then I'm kind of lower down and just try to help get the message out. <laughs> uh, say you're, you're, you're as top as it gets. I was going to say I was I was I was going to say the same. And can I just say also that um, I, I strongly urge anybody who is who doesn't follow David on X to just do so because you, not only um, will you learn an awful lot from going there, but I mean the way that David puts things very clearly and very powerfully. Uh, it's incredibly impressive. I mean, it, speaking as somebody who's uh, married to an, an academic, an English literature academic, who's always a critic of uh, how things are expressed, I mean, she is a great admirer of the, the sort of forcefulness and clarity with which these things are said. And I learn huge amounts from them. Well, thank All you. Right. That's very kind. Fantastic. So let's get started. Let me just say a quick hello to everyone, that, to everyone that is watching us on Rockfin, on Odyssey, on Rumble, on YouTube, and on the Duran.locals.com. And a big shout out to our great, amazing moderators. And I have David's information in the description box down below, and I will add it as a pinned comment as well when the show is over. Alexander, David, Let's talk politics. Let's talk geopolitics. Maybe we start things off with uh, Biden, maybe Bidenomics. I don't know. What do you think, uh, Alexander, David? <laughs> no, let's let's actually definitely start with Biden, Bidenomics, because it may sound extraordinary to say this, but in my opinion, he is at the center of everything. Um, he is the president of the United States. Whatever people say, the United States still makes it still makes the weather. What happens in the United States determines whatever happens everywhere else. And the personality, the policies of the president of the United States and his administration is crucial. And what I also am going to say is that the days when the United States could absorb an administration that wasn't particularly strong are gone. Uh, I mean, the United States more than ever now needs a strong purposeful president in charge not only in my opinion is that not the situation we have at the present but i think in fact all sorts of things are being done at many different levels e economics legal political and of course foreign policy and security policy which we're going to spend a lot of time on by the administration which are affecting the whole world, but also and especially the United States in a in an extremely negative way. And who better to discuss this all with uh, than David Sachs? So, David, um, first of all, your thoughts about the administration and about its role. I mean, am I overstating things about how important it is both for the United States and for the world? I know a lot of people say it doesn't matter who's in charge, it doesn't matter what kind of administration you have, things always turn out much the same. I don't agree. Yeah. I think what the administration is matters. What are your thoughts about this? I think I think it matters hugely, and I think this president has managed to be much more consequential than I think people thought, and not, not in, a, in a good way. Uh, you really get the feeling now of an administration that has lost control of events. Things seem to be careening out of control in, I count, about five different areas. Uh, first, Ukraine. Uh, obviously, Ukraine's being defeated on the battlefield. It's being destroyed. Uh, you, now you have this terrorist attack on Crocus. The Russians are pointing the finger at not just the Ukrainians, but the CIA and MI6 uh, behind them. If those allegations can be proven. It's, it's cost us bell life for World War III. So this whole thing just seems to be spiraling out of control. You already have European leaders 
explicitly calling for World War III, for inserting troops in Ukraine. So, you know, I think the administration had this idea at the beginning that they could fine tune this outcome, that they could turn up the heat on Russia, that they could weaken it, they could, uh, you know, crush its economy. Uh, and again, it was just this, this hubris that they could engineer the outcome they wanted in a fine tuned way. And I think what we're seeing is the war is escalating and it continues to escalate. And it's just very, it's very dangerous. There's a lot more we could say about that. I think the second area that just feels out of control is, is Gaza. Uh, the, pol the administration's policy on this just seems incoherent. On the one hand, they say that the Israelis are bombing Gaza indiscriminately. They're saying the Israelis have gone too far. They're saying the Israelis shouldn't go into Rafah. And yet they're providing the bombs for Israel to do all of those things. Now, whether you are uh, pro-Israel or pro-Palestinian in this conflict, I think that you know both sides can agree that w the administration's actions don't match up with their words and, and it's an incoherent policy. And that's why I think that the Biden administration is sort of l gradually losing the support of both sides amazingly. Uh, the third area, just turning to domestic politics, is the border. I mean, the U.S. border is open. It's a sort of festering wound. Thousands of people are streaming across every day, millions every year. We don't know who they are. Uh, they could be a security threat to the U.S. They could be criminal gangs. Already, our cities seem to be overrun. They can't keep up. Even the mayors of Democrat cities like Chicago and New York have warned that they cannot keep up with the social cost, social burden of all of these migrants. And yet Biden doesn't do anything about it. He told us for three years that the problem didn't exist. Now he's finally acknowledged it, but he blames it on the guy who tried to build a wall. It's just not a credible message. Uh, f fourth area is, is, the, is the fiscal situation. We have a $2 trillion deficit. Uh, we've got multi-trillion dollar deficits as far as the eye can see. And uh, that is priming the pump. It is stimulating the economy. Not In nominal terms, the economy seems to be doing well, but we still have this persistent inflation problem. And no less uh, an economist, a Democrat economist like Larry Summers said the inflation problem is actually much worse than people think. It peaked last year at 18%, not 9%, he said, once you include the cost of borrowing. so And, and Biden insists his latest budget keeps increasing government spending. There's just no recognition of that problem. And then I think, finally, the, I guess the fifth one I would put is the whole lawfare situation. Uh, it just feels completely out of control. It's unprecedented for... Uh, a, a, a president to try and uh, imprison and, and bankrupt his main opponent in the election. I mean, this is a new low in American politics. We've never seen anything like this before. And it was Biden himself who instigated this when he, there was a leak to the New York Times that he thought that Merrick Garland was being too meek and indecisive. And he wanted to see Trump prosecuted. And after that, you know, the, the Garland got Jack Smith to invent a wholly new crime of fraud against the American people that's never been char even charged before. And then the, the local DAs like Alvin Bragg and Fawny Willis took their cues from Washington and have begun, begun this, this lawfare campaign. And of course, it's not just against Trump. But we've seen now this political retaliation against Elon Musk as well. I think it's motivated by the fact that uh, he's opened up free speech on the X platform. And it was Biden himself from the White House podium and said, this guy needs to be looked into. And sure enough, the agencies of the U.S. government have looked into him. We've got a ridiculous government investigation against Tesla for building a glass house, supposedly, <laughs> against SpaceX for not hiring enough illegal immigrants. Amazing. I mean, it's just ludicrous. His compensation package was voided despite the fact that no one thought he could achieve those, those numbers. You get the sense that uh, that just retaliation is just part of the bag of tricks that this administration thinks is okay. I mean, I don't think Nixon in his wildest dreams would have thought of pursuing tactics like this against his enemies list. I mean, the most I thought he did was, was get people audited. Uh, so, uh, you know, again, I, this just feels like a fifth area to me that just feels out of control. Uh, the overall picture is, again, of an administration that just feels like it's losing its grip on events. And why don't I stop there and... <laughs> We can talk about any of those areas. Well, let, let's start with the last, because the lawfare is, I think, extremely disturbing. And of course, it can affect everybody, because if you contaminate and disrupt the legal system, then everything becomes 
increasingly unstable and out of control. I've never known anything like this. I mean, I remember Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon worked within strong American institutions. He could not la la launch lawfare like this against his opponents. The, the, the courts would have refused to cooperate with him. He had to resort to creating his own so-called intelligence agency, his own private intelligence agency, basically the plumbers, small group of detectives and ex Cuban intelligence officers, people of that kind, to do his dirty work for him. And they did it in an utterly clumsy, chaotic, disorganized way. This, by contrast, uses the entire structure of the American government, the, the, the legal side of the American government, to go after your opponents. Now, I come from a country, Greece, where that was common. And I can tell you what how incredibly disruptive that is. And how that can in, in how that can contaminate everything. I would not have believed it possible in the United States, yet it has happened, and it seems to me exactly as you say, it is getting out of control. The cases against Donald Trump are dubious. The cases against Elon Musk are completely absurd. They're completely absurd, and Elon Musk. Is not even the president's political opponent. So what is this all for? And why is why is this even happening? And why don't people come out in the United States and speak out more strongly against it? I think that's a, a, gr a great question. I think the the sad reality is that the media, the mainstream media, is all in favor of it, and so they they defend it. They carry water for it. The they are the leading cheerleaders for for censorship and uh and weaponization and so when the media isn't holding the politicians accountable the politicians are free to go as far as they want to go and i think that the so the media has been a critical enabler of this i mean nixon by contrast obviously couldn't get away with anything because he had such a hostile media but in this case it's all out in the open and i mean you're right you look at the details of some of these cases the documents case against trump Biden did the same thing, you know. Uh, he had the 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 documents in the Corvette or around the Corvette in his garage. Trump is charged with a crime. Biden's it's an accident. Uh, again, you've got the whole January sixth prosecution where the DOJ wrote a memo in researching whether Trump could be prosecuted for incitement, and they determined that he couldn't be. The case wouldn't work. But that wasn't good enough for Biden, so they invented the fraud against the American people charge. You've got Fawny Willis in Georgia turning a RICO statute, which was created to target organized crime against the Trump campaign, including its lawyers who were acting under attorney-client privilege. Uh, I'm forgetting one. Alvin Bragg. He's turned a misdemeanor, a bookkeeping misdemeanor, into, was it, 43 felony counts uh, based on a yet-to-be-disclosed legal theory. So, you know, you have these prosecutors pushing the limits in a way that's never been seen before. My, my own view is that prosecutors should never be creative. Prosecutors should enforce the law. Everyone should know what the law is. You don't want them inventing novel charges after the fact, certainly not to get people. But again, if the media is not going to hold these prosecutors accountable, in fact, if they're going to celebrate them, then this will continue. And I, you know, I'm sad to say that I think if Biden is elected, you'll see these types of tactics continue to be pursued in a second term against a much greater range of people. I mean, I think Trump and Elon are the big fish. And if the, the Biden administration gets away with this, they're going to start going after smaller fish. And that, that would be chaotic. By the way, I completely agree with your point as somebody who's worked in the legal system. Absolutely, you should never be creative if you are prosecuting that is an absolute that's a recipe for total disaster you should be conservative very conservative you should follow precedent and follow the law that's what you're there for let's talk about the fiscal side and the policies the economic policies of the united of, of the administration now in europe they're widely praised in britain 
people come and tell us why don't we do the same here if biden can he can you know expand the economy in the way that he is we have this enormously dynamic economy in the united states whereas our economy is at a standstill what we need to do is put the brake on the fiscal accelerator and all will be well and this is Keynesianism. Is it even Keynesianism? I think Keynes would not agree with that, by the way. I think he would look at this and uh, turn white with well, horror. K K Keynes said you should stimulate the economy in a recession, not when it's already doing well. That would lead to overheating, actually. Well, that's exactly right. And because... that's exactly what happened. Is that's that's exactly... why the inflation came. So I think Keynes would have been very much against it. No, Bidenomics is a policy of pumping trillions of dollars of stimulus into a growing economy. It's an experiment that's never been tried before. I mean, the Keynesians believed, again, that you would use government spending as a stabilizer so that when the economy is doing poorly, government spends maybe on, on welfare, things like that, to help balance things out. When the economy is doing well, you can cut back. Of course, the cutbacks never happen. That's just part of the political process. So government spending ends up being a one-way ratchet. But in any event, that was sort of the traditional Keynesian view. I think what's new about Bidenomics is, again, we had a recovery in the first quarter of 2021 when Biden took office. His first act was to pass that $2 trillion COVID relief bill, the so-called American Rescue Plan, even though COVID was completely winding down. And that was passed along straight party lines. And Larry Summers, again, he warned that this could lead to inflation. Inflation was really low. It was only 2%. He said that this could lead to inflation. And lo and behold, the inflation came. It was 5% that summer. And then it grew to the 9% official number by the next year. And then that caused the Fed to jack up interest rates from zero to five and a half percent in one year in the fastest rate tightening cycle we've ever had. And that's caused a whole bunch of whipsawing effects in the banking system. And it's made people feel a lot worse off because their cost of borrowing's gone up. So if you want to buy a house, you can't do that anymore. If you have a want to buy a car and you know have a car payment, that's more expensive, and so on. So I think one of the reasons why the American people don't feel like the economy is that great, even though the unemployment numbers are very low and the GDP growth numbers are still good and the stock market's at an all-time high, is because there's some sense in which this whole thing's been artificially juiced. And it's unsustainable. I mean, we can't continue to run $2 trillion deficits every year in peacetime. Well, I guess, I guess that's debatable now, but without us being directly in a war, let's put it that way, uh, without us being in a recession. And we're up to what, 34, 35 trillion in, in debt. And uh, our interest expense is now over a trillion a year. Everyone knows this isn't sustainable. And yet there's no effort made to combat it. In fact, it, the latest budget would increase spending by 18%. So again, you just have this feeling that things are just careening. Uh, um, do, do you feel as an entrepreneur that this is distorting the economy, that there's a lot of malinvestment going on? Because that's also my own feeling. Of course, I'm looking at this from a distance. I'm in London. Mm -hmm. But um, how does it feel to you? Because again, when there's this kind of enormous fiscal acceleration, to my, in my experience, that is what tends to happen. Money flows around. It's yeah. not going where it should be going. In fact, it, it, it creates all kinds of distortions and imbalances, which actually weaken the economy rather than strengthen it. Yeah, I, and, that, and that's what happened, I think, in 2020 and 2021, especially 2021. We had an asset super bubble and a lot of money flowed into, let's call it risk assets. So we saw tons of money pouring into Silicon Valley from crossover investors, you know, public hedge funds, uh, non-traditional Silicon Valley investors. Uh, sometimes they're dismissively called tourist investors here because they tend to come and go and they most of them have now left. Uh, and then, of course, uh, there, there was just a lot of very speculative investment. And that was driven, I think, by ZERP, you know, the zero interest rate policy combined with... Um, this, this kind of airdropping of all this, this stimulus related to COVID, I think that now that has somewhat subsided because interest rates are so high. So if you can get a 5.5% return risk-free, the hurdle rate on investment really goes up. And you need – so the, the new money that's pouring in now I think has slowed down. So the interest rates have combated that, uh, but at, at a cost, which is just that the, the ordinary American's borrowing cost has now gone way up. So – 
again, you, we're, we're being whipsawed here from, you know, uh, uh, a interest rate policy and a fiscal policy that was way too loose. Then it got very tight. Uh, neither one was ideal. It would have been better if, if we had just kind of pursued a more normal strategy. Um, but, but Alexander, just to go back to your point about why doesn't Britain try it? I mean, the U.S. has tremendous uh, room to pursue a policy like this because it's the world's reserve currency. And so it can get away with things that other countries can't. And, um, you know, there's a lot of rune. What was the Adam Smith line? There's a lot of rune in a nation. There's a lot of rune in a reserve currency. Uh, it, 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 the U.S. can just keep doing this until we can't. And no one knows where that point is. No one knows where it's going to break. But uh, so, but so, I, so I don't think it would work for other countries. And I don't even think it's going to work for the U.S. long term. But no one knows exactly where the breaking point is. No, oh, I think you're muted. I am. Sorry. You are, it does seem to me as if, as I said, we have a fiscal situation, which of which exactly, as you said, the government is losing control. You cannot run budgets like this indefinitely. And you cannot, you cannot allow a situation like the one we have on the border to continue indefinitely. That is an absolute loss of control. One of the functions of governments is to control borders. The government doesn't control the border. What sort of a government is it at the end of the day? I mean, that is one of the key right. functions of what a government is supposed to be. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, uh, you know, I say this as an immigrant. I moved to America with my family when I was five years old. We, I became a citizen when I was 10. Uh, Elon, similar, came came later, uh, you know, uh, was an immigrant. This has nothing to do with legal immigration. This is basically uncontrolled mass migration being allowed into the United States. We just don't know who these people are. Uh, many of them are destitute. They put a huge burden on our social services and they pose uh, a national security threat and potentially a crime threat. And uh, virtually every week now, there's some new horror story about an American citizen who has been killed by, you know, a, an illegal immigrant. And um, I mean, it's it's anecdotal, but none of these things should be happening. And it is a core government responsibility. And you, you have to wonder why the administration is allowing this. Uh, what they claim is they need new legislative authority in order to take action on the problem. And I, I just don't see how that's credible. I mean, Trump was able to stop this or at least have one-tenth the amount. I mean, I think it, under Trump, there are about 400,000 encounters of these so-called encounters every year. Now we're up to close to something like 4 million under Biden. And of course, that's just the ones that they know about. Those are the, those are the people they intercept. So the real number is probably much higher than that. In any event, Trump, through executive orders, was able to take action on this problem. On Biden's first day in office, he repealed all those executive orders. And, you know, it's so dysfunctional now that you have to wonder, why, why are they doing this? And, you know, there's a lot of people speculate that, you know, they're trying to import future voters for the Democratic Party. I think even if that's true, it would be, it would be crazy because this could cost them the election. So you would think that if they cared about the election, they would just stop it, at least for now. And then maybe they return to this policy in the second term. But but I think they're so locked in on this policy. I think that, you know, they came in wanting to undo everything Trump did, no matter whether it was right or wrong. And I, they repealed all of his executive orders. And I think that I think the reason they can't do anything now is because if they were to reinstate the executive orders need to fix the problem, people would notice that Trump was right. And so I think this creates this like lock in where, you know, they have to just, I guess, try and fudge their way through this problem until the election. I should say I, too, am an, uh, am an immigrant. I'm an immigrant to Britain. I came here when I was seven. And of course, I went through a legal process. All of us support legal immigration. Illegal immigration is something completely different because exactly as you said, by definition, it is not something you control. And again, I find some of the things that are happening in the United States now, I mean, not only is illegal immigration allowed, but it's if, if I'm hearing things correctly, people who are coming into the United States illegally are acquiring positions which one is surprised that they can possibly be acquiring. They're being recruited into the military, for example, if this is correct, and 
police services. I, I even heard a story, I don't know whether this is true, that one of them has been appointed to an electoral commission somewhere. <laughs> now, I don't know whether this is true, by the way. Perhaps, <laughs> perhaps you've heard of this. But I mean, these are these are astonishing things. And it it it, it doesn't just erode. The, the, the difference between legal and illegal in immigration, which is already a serious thing. But of course, it also il ultimately uh, devalues the whole concept of citizenship, which is what legal immigration is supposed to lead to if you want to immigrate into a country in a lawful way. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I completely agree. I mean, and, and we know this is a deliberate policy because... Um, the migrants are being ushered in. All they have to do is um, is say a secret word or, or a magical word, asylum, that you know the cartels or whoever's ushering them in tells them to, and they're given a ticket uh, to basically appear in court in three years, four years, five years, whatever, and they're just allowed into the country. And then there's buses or even plane flights that will take them all around the country. And there's there's a story in New York about how they're being given uh, debit cards and you know with preloaded cash amounts on it and phones and all sorts of things. So, you know, it's, this is a deliberate policy. It's just, I, I don't understand how the administration can defend it. It just seems completely inoffensible to me. So let's go to, let's go to the other, one of the other topics you mentioned, which is Gaza. <laughs> I, you, you mentioned how things are out of con control and how incoherent they are. Well, how much more incoherent can you get than this? you are in the security council you allow a ceasefire resolution to pass you say that you know well it's this you're abstaining on it but you know you're letting it pass then the next day you walk it back you then pretend that this resolution isn't legally binding which by the way it is um you're say that you know you're angry with president with prime minister netanyahu you even suggest that you want him to step down you get one of your senators chuck schumer to say that he should step down something which by the way i'm concerned about i mean i don't personally agree with prime minister netanyahu but i don't think it's america's job to tell him to tell israel who should be its prime minister but that's my own perhaps unfashionable view. But anyway, you do all of these things, and at the same time, you continue to provide arms to Israel and support Israel in whatever it is that it's doing. It, again, it seems very incoherent, and I can say definitely, because we are at the Iran in contact with people from that region, it is eroding support in the region for the United States, and it is isolating Israel. It is achieving the opposite of whatever policy, what, whatever the policy is supposed to be achieving, which presumably is to strengthen the positions of the United States and increase the security of Israel. Or am I getting this wrong in some way? No, I, I agree with you. I think that uh, Israel's policy has, has completely backfired. I mean, I, I basically tweeted that and got ratioed for it uh, as soon as the bombing of Gaza began. And let me preface this by saying that I'm a supporter of Israel in the sense that I believe that Israel has a right to exist and I want to see it survive and thrive. Uh, you know, I, I, I feel like I'm, I'm a moderate on this question. I mean, I think ultimately um, the, the right solution here would have been a, some sort of two-state solution, uh, you know, ideally done 20 years ago. But, um, but you know, as soon as this, this bombing uh, began, I said that what... Hamas did was an atrocity, was an unconscionable. Israel's has a right to defend itself. Obviously, it's going to want to take action against Hamas. And yet, bombing uh, a civilian population in Gaza that really can't go anywhere is, is obviously going to backfire horribly. And you see that Israel is losing the support of virtually the entire world. And I think within the U.S., Israel is really losing the support of young people. I think that there's still, uh, I think there's a huge generation gap on this issue. I just don't see how this is good uh, for Israel long term. I don't see how this is in its interest, as well as the fact that it's creating a humanitarian catastrophe. And I feel uh, sorry for the Palestinian people as well. And I think that Biden could have played a much more constructive role here. You know, I think the Israeli mentality was summed up by their famed general, Moshe Dayan, who said that Israel must be like a mad dog, too dangerous to be touched. That's sort of the Israeli mentality is that they're surrounded on all sides by enemies. And so they must 
essentially overreact in order to create deterrence. I think this is sort of the Israeli mindset. And so I think American presidents understanding this have always played a role in restraining Israel and making sure they didn't go too far. Eisenhower made sure that the Israelis didn't go too far at Suez in 1956. Kissinger and Nixon made sure that the Israelis didn't go too far in 1973. Reagan called up Menachem Begin in 1982 and told him to stop bombing Lebanon. He was creating a Holocaust. So American presidents have, have sort of understood that the, the American role here, while being a friend to Israel, is also to make sure they don't go too far uh, and do something that's not in their own interest, never mind the interest of the United States. And I think Biden just didn't understand that, kind of missed that opportunity, went to Israel early, gave Biden, or sorry, gave Netanyahu the bear hug and gave him carte blanche effectively. And now he's behind the eight ball trying to rein in Netanyahu. And this is just entirely too late. And, you know, he needed to figure out what the American strategy was, what the American position was, and what American red lines were with respect to Israel's invasion of Gaza at the very beginning. And then as opposed to reacting in the face of, of this sort of steady cascade of atrocities. I, I completely agree. I mean, I would say that one of the fundamental strategic errors, or rather acts of strategic ignorance that the administration made at the beginning, was that they didn't understand one very simple fact, which is that Arab governments, before 7th October, disliked Hamas. They are all already deeply hostile to it. Um, the Saudis don't like them. The um, other Gulf states don't like them, except for Qatar, which has particular reasons to support them. Egypt and Jordan loathe them. With If they worked with the Arab states, perhaps if they'd sought with the Arab states resolutions against Hamas from the Security Council, the UN Security Council, right at the outset, they would have got them. They would have had action against Hamas leaders under Chapter 7. They would have had actions against Hamas's funding. They could have had demands that these people be referred to the um, International Criminal Court. Lots of things could have been done then. And it could have been done with the support of the Arab countries. And it could have accelerated the process of diplomatic recognition for Israel by countries like Saudi Arabia. And this pressure, this is what I believe cumulatively could have succeeded. It would ultimately have broken Hamas because Hamas has to function within an Arab world which doesn't like it, but now obviously supports it. If you isolate it in that kind of way, it would have broken. And Israel's position could have been made much stronger because Arabs, Arab leaders, Arab countries were sympathetic to Israel, as most of the world was on the 7th of October. All that sympathy has been thrown away. Uh, it has been one of the most extraordinary state failures of statesmanship that I have ever seen. And you mentioned various previous US presidents and how much more intelligently they handled this situation. And again, this administration, far from handling the situation at all, as far as I could see, they gave out blank, they gave Netanyahu a blank check, which is something you should never do. Yeah, I mean, so I, I agree and uh, completely. And I, I heard I heard you make this case at the very beginning in the wake of October 7th about the diplomatic course that Israel could have pursued. They could have restored security. I mean, they could have uh, reinstated the or, or fixed the wall around Gaza. They could have uh, stopped the tunnels coming out of Gaza and then pursued this diplomatic strategy. I think it would have taken incredible restraint and forbearance on the part of you know the Israeli public and politicians. Maybe that level of restraint was unrealistic, but I agree with you that it would have been better for them because what is the end result of the current strategy? It's uh, a war with no end in sight. It looks like a quagmire. The Palestinian population has been completely radicalized. I don't see how this is going to create fewer terrorists. Uh, and then, of course, the whole Middle East now, uh, not to mention the world has really turned against Israel. And I, I think this is going to ensure support for Hamas for 
years and years to come. Uh, so it just feels like this policy has backfired. And I think the Israeli point of view on this is, well, we're just going to destroy Hamas. But, but how? I mean, there was an article just in the Washington Post this morning where as they're bombing um, Rafa, the, the Hamas pop back up in the north. So they're playing whack-a-mole now. <laughs> you know, how are they... <laughs> How are they actually going to uh, destroy all of Hamas? It just doesn't, I mean, they completely blend in with the population. So unless you're willing to destroy the, kill the entire civilian population, I don't, I mean, I, I don't think Israel would, I, hopefully they, we're not talking about that. So, um, although I think a lot of people do believe that, that, you know, there is a genocide going on, but I, but in any event, the, the point is just that uh, it, it, they're pursuing this objective that seems militarily uh, unobtainable and uh and in the process they're creating a, a much worse situation so i mean look i think this is mostly an israeli problem but the problem is that you know as i've heard mirsheimer say on your program uh we're joined at the hip and uh the, the america is and so it becomes our problem as well uh and uh yeah I, at this point i don't know what the way out of it is I, I agree. I don't know what the way out of it is now. I think we have to work through it and hope for the best. Well, hope for the best on that even bigger crisis. I think it was in the Washington Post that they were now admitting that a debacle on, you know, well, actually much worse than Afghanistan is now looming. A war in Ukraine, which has gone horribly wrong at almost every level. And one of the things, again, that I don't understand about that war, I, I have been asking various people who were experts on things about the war, about Ukraine, about Russia, about Russian economy, about military affairs. People who've been to Russian factories have some knowledge of how Russia works. And they all tell me one and the same thing. None of them have been consulted. None of them have been spoken to. I don't mean the expert community in Washington, the Fiona Hills and the Michael McFalls and people <laughs> like that. I mean, the real ones, the real experts who've actually done work in Russia, who worked on the oil fields and in the factories, who have had contacts with the military. I met an ex-spy who actually went to uh, Ukraine with, for the British, met lots of people there in the military, actually got befriended by the military, a very strange story. But I mean, none of them were consulted and a whole set of decisions were made. And well, where are the, where is where is it all leading? Well, perhaps we said many times, you talked an awful lot about Ukraine. David, maybe you can tell us your views about the overall situation in Ukraine. Well, I think my views are similar to, to yours and I've learned a lot from your, your uh, podcast over the past year. Um, just by the way, the, I think I discovered your podcast, uh, as the battle of Bakhmut was going on. Yeah, I think it was about a year ago and it hadn't concluded yet, but, but I remember very clearly that you guys were describing the situation as a cauldron where the Ukrainians were continuing to pour in more troops and they were getting destroyed and the Russians were very happy with the situation. And then in the mainstream media and, you know, the, their think tanks like ISW were describing the situation as the as a culmination of the the russian attack the russian attack was culminating it was cauldron versus culmination and i remember thinking that wow like what these guys are saying is so 180 degree different than everything else i'm hearing that if they end up being right about this then i'll know that they're legit and they've figured this thing out and that is exactly what happened and then of course we had the counter offensive where you guys reported right from the beginning that the thing was a debacle we all should have, as soon as the tanks ran into minefields and they had no solution for that, we should have known. But it went on for months and months and months and you guys accurately reported it. So in any event, you know, being an investor, I look at track record, you know, like whose track record is good. No one seems to do this. They never asked for McFall. Well, did the things he predicted come true? No, he just moves on to the next fantasy or hoax or whatever. In any event, that's how I became acquainted with uh, your, your shows. And... Um, in any event, I've, I've, I've learned a lot. Um, I mean, I think the situation now is that everything that Biden claimed about this war has not only not come true, it's come true in reverse. He said that he would crush the Russian economy. The Russian economy is doing fine. It's actually outperforming the G7. It's the European economies that are in recession. It's our allies who've been crushed. He said that, uh, or it was uh, 
his Secretary of Defense, Austin, said that we would weaken the Russian military. In fact, the Russian military has become stronger. They've ramped up their massive industrial production. They're making more of everything, as you've reported, drones, planes, bombs, um, artillery shells, and their, uh, their military is much bigger. They've got huge numbers of people volunteering. It's not conscription. They're, the Russian people seem to be behind this war and they're volunteering and then they're getting proper training. They're not sent to the front lines right away. And they're getting battle tested and battle hardened, especially against Western weapons. So the Russian military has only gotten stronger and it's our own American and NATO stockpiles that have been emptied out. So we're the ones who've been weakened by this. Then you've got diplomatic. Uh, you know, Biden said that this war would isolate Putin. In fact, Putin and the Russians, the rest of the world doesn't seem to be buying into this. Putin just did a trip to the Middle East where he was greeted like a conquering hero by MBZ and MBS and UAE and Saudi Arabia. Uh, the Indians, the Brazilians, it's not, you know, not just quote authoritarian countries that have uh, not accepted our view of the the war. It's also democracies like, uh, you know, India and Brazil and, and other countries. So the rest of the, war, the world has not necessarily gone along with us on this. And in fact, uh, you mentioned Fiona Hill. She her, despite being a, a massive Russia hawk, she said that the war was basically backfiring, that, that it was causing the rest of the world to resist American leadership. She declared Pax Americana was over. So, you know, Biden thought that he would strengthen the West. He was constantly talking about unity, resolve, leadership. In fact, even liberal interventionists like Fiona Hill or like Joseph Burrell, they're now talking about uh, the, the end of Pax Americana. So this thing is backfired massively. And then, of course, you've got the humanitarian dimension of this, where Biden said that he would ease the suffering of the Ukrainian people through this policy. Instead, it looks like the country is facing demographic collapse with all the people who've left, uh, you know, over 10 million, all the women and children, the, the men who can afford to bribe their way out of the country have left. And of course, you know, at least half a million casualties. And then you know, you see all these videos of people being rounded up off the streets at gunpoint in order to be conscripted. I mean, they've run out of volunteers. They don't want to fight anymore. At least the majority of people don't. And this is what American appropriations will be funding, is if we appropriate another $60 billion or $20 billion or whatever, it's going to be used to round up hundreds of thousands of young Ukrainians who are hiding in their homes, who do not want to fight, who would bribe their way out of the country if they didn't if they had money, but they're too poor to do so. And these people will be rounded up at gunpoint to fight a doomed war. I think this is one of the worst things the United States has ever done. Why doesn't the administration change policy? This is failing <laughs> disastrously. I think even they understand it at some level. People in Europe do. I mean, you know, this is, you know, the art of statesmanship is, you know, if you see things, something going wrong and catastrophically wrong like this is, well, then you, you change your policy. Perhaps you contact the other side. You come to some kind of an agreement. Putin is the kind of man who in the past has shown a certain willingness to engage in diplomacy. He said, I mean, he's very critical of himself now. It's going to make it very difficult. But anyway, that's his track record. He always still says he's up for negotiations, despite all of that. Why did you do it? Why did they try? Because they control the narrative. There's no reason for them to admit that they've got egg all over their face. Uh, I mean, this administration, uh, they not only have egg on their face. I mean, they basically went to the, the buffet line, you know, with the trays of scrambled eggs and stuck their head all the way in it. They've got, I mean, it is, it's a really extreme case, but, but, they don't have to admit it because, again, they control the narrative. And so who says that Ukraine is losing the war? I mean, they've maintained that they were winning. They would evict the Russians in this counteroffensive. Oh, the counteroffensive didn't work. Well, it's a stalemate. Don't worry, they're not losing. Oh, wait, it's not a stalemate. They're losing territory. Well, this new strategy is hold and build. I mean, there's always some new answer. And, I mean, the reality is that, as with any foreign policy issue, the American people uh, you know, it's it's not first and foremost on, on their minds if Americans are not fighting. And so the administration just has wide latitude to pursue the, the policy that they want. I think people are, at least in the Republican Party, have woken up to the, the risk of this war and the cost of it. 
And I think the vast majority of Republicans have no interest in funding another 60 billion, but it's become a highly partisan issue now. And I think Democrats are even more invested in it if possible, because it's an election year issue. And of course, there, the establishment GOP, which is filled with war hawks, is willing to continue funding it. And the mainstream media will spin the best narrative about it. And so there's no reason, really, there's no price for the administration in, um, in, uh, that, that they're paying right now that they need to change course and acknowledge the failure. So they're going to keep going with the policy until they can, until events force them not to, to until they can't continue with it. And so I, I think that this policy will continue until Ukraine collapses, basically. One last comment, and then I, I, I'm done, which is this briefly, that it all ties in together, because um, you've explained, you, you you mentioned at the beginning how the administration is able to control the, ma- the narrative. The media basically covers for it, whatever they do, be it the fiscal policy, the, the collapse of the situation in the border, um, all of those things, and of course Ukraine, and of course the Middle East, the lawfare as well, they're able to do all of these things because they're protected, because they are immune from criticism as a, because of them. And I'm going to suggest that's also why they're going after Elon Musk at the end of the day, because he's trying to open up Twitter to X, or I should say, sorry, not Twitter, X. He's trying to open up X so that there can actually be discussion as, of course, was the is the American principle the idea of open debate where information is properly exchanged, where people are properly informed about what is happening so that there is an informed citizenry. I think that's the language of the First Amendment or or, 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 or the rules, able to make decisions. And of course, if you don't have information, you can't make proper decisions. So by preventing criticism through applying this sort of media control, they're ensuring that decisions which they make, which are bad, get perpetuated. That's not so much a question. It's just a... a no, I think you're right. It's, yeah. It seems like, um, you know, it, 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 this is not democracy. I mean, you're right. De- democracy requires a well-educated population. But if, if the information that we're getting is somehow tainted, then it, it undermines the ability of the of the population to make informed decisions. And I was there at uh, Twitter, you know, now X, when the Twitter files were opened up. And what did we learn? We learned that the FBI had 80 agents reviewing posts on Twitter to be taken down, that they were meeting with the uh, trust and safety team, basically the censorship team at Twitter on a weekly basis. And that the FBI was acting as the, the, the belly button. That was the word of the, um, the FBI office chief. I think his name was Elvis Chan. It was, the FBI was acting as the belly button, the central conduit for the entire intelligence community. I mean, this was, I think, an unprecedented set of revelations about how the government was interfering in speech in, I mean, an utterly unprecedented way. And yet the, the mainstream media just refused to cover it. They kept calling it a nothing burger. And then when the Republicans managed to do a hearing about it on Capitol Hill, they somehow turned it into a story about, um, I think, a Twitter spat that Trump had with Chrissy Teigen or something. <laughs> so, you know, we can't, we can't it, 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 you know, it's, it's the, the whole thing was sort of covered up. But, you know, we, we, we learn about this, this interaction. We also learned that the, the whole Hamilton 68 dashboard, which was used as a basis for thousands of stories over the last several years, um, claiming that the Russians were influencing our public debate, it was all a total hoax. It was all a total and complete fraud. Have any of those thousands of stories been retracted? Not to my knowledge. Um, in any event, uh, you know, I, I agree with you. I think this is the heart of why uh, Elon's become persona non grata is that he opened up X for free speech. And, and we learned through the Twitter files that it wasn't just happening at Twitter that these government agencies were coordinating with all the big tech companies. And so they were in the process of asserting total information control. There was a momentum to this. Remember, it wasn't just about hate speech. I mean, during COVID, they censored true medical opinions like Jay Bhattacharya about about COVID. 
about where the virus came from, about even the, you know, just facts like the um, case fatality rate or in infection fatality rate, about the efficacy of lockdowns, certainly about the efficacy of vaccines. All these topics were prohibited. And there was a momentum to the censorship where it felt like every, every month a new category of thought and opinion was being walled off and you couldn't express a dissenting opinion. You could only reaffirm the official narrative. And, and, and I think that that galloping censorship would have continued into many more categories. I really shudder to think about what would happen with this war in Ukraine if Elon hadn't bought Twitter. Would we even be able to talk about the things that we're talking about today and have them be disseminated? I, I, I doubt it. Uh, so I think that, you know, Elon was sort of, um, it was definitely the thing they didn't plan on to have this. It was a fluke. I mean, you had this billionaire, the world's richest man, decide to pull an intervention because as, a Ameri as an immigrant to America who became a citizen, believes in free speech so much that he was willing to risk and, and lose tens of billions of dollars to restore free speech in America. I mean, that definitely was not on the regime's bingo card. And that is what has made him you know, an enemy and, and he's being targeted. And this is why I think that, you know, I, I, I hope that we have a change in, in administration in November, because I think that this will continue if they're allowed to get away with it. I entirely agree. I should say it also means shows that Elon Musk is a much truer American than most of his critics are, than his critics are. As, as, uh, as, as legal immigrants often are, you know, they appreciate the freedoms that we have here. Exactly. Uh, David Sachs, this has uh, been a wonderful program for me. I'm going to hand over to Alex, I, but I, I, I have finished. Thank you for your clear and uh, clear and straightforward answers to my questions. David, we have some questions for you. Okay. But before we get to those questions, if you have time to answer a few questions, yeah, I'm hey, good. This is fun. We're, I mean, fantastic, fantastic. <laughs> One question we we have gotten a lot uh, over the past uh, week is TikTok. Oh yeah, talk about the the legislation for for TikTok, and it's much more than just TikTok, right? Okay, well, let me first describe what the bill does because I've read it very carefully, and um, even proponents of the bill have acknowledged that I, I, I that I understand it. Uh, so it's it's not just a TikTok ban. Yes, it would target TikTok and ByteDance and force ByteDance to divest ownership of of TikTok within six months, or the app will be banned completely. So it does that. But in addition to that, it bans or prohibits any of what they call foreign adversary controlled applications, or, or it's called a FACA for short, from operating in the United States. And a FACA, again, a foreign adversary controlled application is not just an app, and it's not just a foreign owned company. It can be any American owned website or application that is in the, let's call it content sharing space that has a million monthly active users. So it applies to all of those. So every social network certainly would be uh, covered under this. And when you look under the language, which is buried in the definitions of what it means to be controlled by a foreign adversary, it says that you're subject to the direction or control of, of basically a person in a foreign adversary or a, a, or a group of investors. Oops. Oh, how do we get rid of the, do you guys see the thumb? Oh, there it goes. Okay, good. Uh, you're subject to the direction of a, a person in one of these foreign adversary countries. Um, so this is where I my alarm bells start going off, is what what does subject to the direction of mean? Now, I know that proponents of the bill say this is well understood legal language, like look at securities laws, precedents. Uh, they, they define it. It's actually a narrow definition. I'm like, oh, really? Well, did... Um, did, did Fonnie Willis care about the definition of RICO when she brought her lawsuit? Did Alvin Bragg care about the definition of a misdemeanor and statute of limitations when he brought his 43 felonies? Did, uh, I could go on. I mean, did Jack Smith care about hundreds of law, years of fraud precedent when he invented his novel crime? No, of course not. We live in an age of weaponization. And any ambiguity or discretion that you create in these laws will absolutely be used by a future creative attorney general, just like the Patriot Act was weaponized against the American people. This will be too. It's pretty obvious, I think, to see where this leads. Would a future attorney general 
maybe in a second Biden administration, somebody tougher, someone who Biden likes better than Merrick Garland, maybe Jack Smith. Could he say that Elon is subject to the direction of the Chinese Communist Party because he has a factory in Shanghai and therefore they have leverage over him and therefore he must divest ownership of Twitter? Why couldn't they make that case? Why wouldn't it be extremely damaging uh, for him just to be in for the Justice Department just to open that investigation and harass him and vex him with costly litigation, which this bill would now create? And of course, they could do this to, to, to others. I mean, Trump owns Truth Social. On virtually a daily basis, he is, is accused of being an agent of Vladimir Putin. That makes him subject to the direction of a foreign adversary. So why can't they force him to divest ownership of Truth Social? And if you won't do that, well, it is ban it. I mean, this is what we're talking about here. This would create the powers to do that. So um, I would say that at a minimum, this legislation needs to remove all the wiggle room around this language. They should not be covering American-owned websites and applications. And really, quite frankly, this whole issue should be dealt with in a trade bill, not in some sort of, you know, in terms of a reciprocal trade agreement between the U.S. and China. That would be the way to, to deal with this. It should not be dealt with in legislation that, again, could target American companies. Right. Yeah. Telegram. They could go after Telegram. What What do you say, David, to, to the argument that people make um, who are for this legislation, the few people that are for this legislation who say, well, China blocks our uh, social networks and our apps? Well, that, yeah, that's a reciprocity argument. So uh, I think that if you want to make trade reciprocal be between the U.S. and China, then, like I said, let's do it in a trade bill. And we can say, OK, if China won't open its markets to our social networks we don't need to open uh our markets to their social networks and and at least then the the blast area the, the blast radius of this legislation would be tightly controlled that would be the way to deal with reciprocity but but look i i think that reciprocity is good but i don't know that i would do it for its own sake i mean i think that america we have a more open we have a first amendment we have a more open uh marketplace of ideas here and, um, and, and, and China doesn't, and, and the same you know, China hawks would say that's why we're morally superior to China. So, uh, you know, whether you believe that or not, the point is just that uh, we don't have to have reciprocity in every aspect, but if we do, then do it as a, as a trade bill. Right. All right, let's get to some questions. Uh, Joanna says, David, thoughts on the stock market over the next year? Not financial <laughs> advice, not financial <laughs> advice, but uh, well, if if you were to have any thoughts on the stock stock market, what would you what would you say? You know, this is so hard to predict. I, I don't. I mean, I've predicted ten of the last three recessions. So uh, you know, I I thought we'd already be in a recession by now, and I've, I've been proven wrong. Uh, you know, look, I think that right now the stock market is driven by the performance of companies which seems to be pretty good right now. And then it's driven by interest rate policy. And uh, right now, I think it's the market is pricing in three rate cuts this year with 70% probability. So, you know, if the Fed does that, then uh, things will stay on track, at least with respect to rate expectations. And if inflation for some reason is higher and the Fed doesn't feel like it can do that, then there could be um, an adjustment. So that'd be like the fr one framework to look at it. I don't want to predict which way it's actually going to go. Right. Uh, Sparky says, poor border security in the U.S. is still mainly due to keep wages down. Correction, keep labor costs in general, not just wages. Your thoughts? I think that, um, I think that is one motivation. And uh, it, it the, the economic motivation to have cheap labor in the U.S. This actually goes back all the way to uh, the Wall Street Journal in the 1980s uh, under, I mean, I'm going way back here, but uh, under Bob Bartley, famed sort of neocon editor-in-chief of, of the Wall Street Journal. It was a kind of neocon view that you would have open trade, open borders, uh, open movement of labor and capital. And, uh, and in fact, the Wall Street Journal at one point suggested that we should have a constitutional amendment uh, saying that the border should be open. And I, and I think there was a huge economic motivation to that. I think that, that it was kind of a, a view that the world is flat type, type idea. And I think that 
what we've discovered over the last few decades is obviously the, the world doesn't work like that. It's just not that simple. And I actually don't think that's the main rationale for it anymore. I actually think that, um, I mean, I'm not sure there is a, I don't think there is a good policy reason for it, but I think that Democrats at various times have acknowledged that mass migration benefits them. So, uh, you know, that, that seems like a stronger motivation at this point, but I don't, I don't know exactly. I think perhaps it's not necessary to get into the motivations of the people who are pursuing this policy. It's just enough to say that the policy doesn't make sense. Yeah. Uh, Joe Public says mass migration to Western countries are all part of the UN Agenda 2030 and the NWO in order to dilute national identity. What do you think about that argument to dilute national identity? Yeah, I think I think the indigenous peoples of Europe are up in arms about this uh, unlimited mass migration. It does change the culture of, of their country. I mean, if you're going to be a democracy, you have to care about, you know, the population of, of your country. Um, because if if, you know, if the majority changes to people with radically different uh, views or values or attitudes, then obviously it has a huge impact on the way the country is governed. So. Uh, yeah, look, I think this this sort of um, globalist idea of unrestricted immigration and open borders, it just feels anachronistic to me. Uh, and the people have spoken, I think, the, I think throughout the West. I think this is one of the major reasons why populists are on the rise, is this policy does not benefit the, the people currently living in these countries. By the way, this is true even, you know, in the U.S., if you look at... Um, Hispanic voters in the U.S., there's been a pretty decent uh, movement of Hispanic voters into the Republican Party. They do not favor these open border policies either. So, you know, if you're a legal resident of one of these countries, it does not benefit you to have this unrestricted mass migration. And it doesn't really matter uh, what what race uh, you are. This is not a racial thing. Yeah, a lot of questions. Let's Let's do... Let me see. Let's do two, two or three more, two more. Uh, Commando Crossfire says, Russia has as much STEM graduates as the U.S. despite half the population. If democracy depends on, on education and informed public, which one is a democracy? Which one is democratic? Sorry, which one is democratic is the question. Well, I think we're kind of mixing up a couple of concepts there, right? So um, there's no question Russia has an educated population. It's always been good at math, chess, things like that. Uh, a lot of engineers. Russia's good at building things. Um, as you guys have talked about in your show, it's not just a gas station with nukes. That's kind of a antiquated view. The Russians have proved that they have a modern economy that's capable of producing a lot of things. And um, uh, now, I think with respect to the U.S., where the U.S. really has an advantage, I think, is, um, is in startup innovation. The U.S. is very, I mean, this is this is my world. And um, the U.S. is very good at swarming a new technology platform in a completely decentralized way. So you have, for example, with AI, you know, uh, OpenAI launches this ChatGPT product in, what was it, November of um, 2022. And in the last, call it year and a half, there's been an absolute explosion of AI startups. And that's not because there was any central directive to make that happen. It's because the talent, the founders, the, the VCs who write the checks all kind of gravitate towards this area. And then they run hundreds or thousands of experiments and most of them fail, but a few of them pay off in a huge way. And, and this is, I think this is the heart of what has made the American economy dynamic. Um, I'm still very bullish about that part of the American economy. Let's call it the, the microeconomy. I've got all these concerns about the macroeconomy, our unsustainable fiscal picture, the deficits and the debt. Uh, and, I, and I just don't know how those two things reconcile each other. I mean, I go back and forth on this about whether I should be optimistic or pessimistic. I'm pessimistic about the macro and optimistic about the micro. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Interesting. All right. Uh, one more. One more, uh, David. Uh, mm -hmm. From Sparky, David, what do you think of the 1996 Telecom Act? It only allowed news media consolidation. It not only allowed news media consolidation, it removed logistical barriers between government and telecoms, allowing limitless electronic surveillance. 
you know, I didn't, I, I didn't know that. So uh, that's just not, sorry, I'm just not deep on that, that topic. I'm not sure what the, the answer is. Hmm. Okay. And uh, why can't we have from TNT, why can't we have David Sachs as president? <laughs> you want to answer that? Or? <laughs> well, I wasn't, I wasn't born in the United States, so it's not even a fantasy of mine. Uh, right. But I, I have no interest in, in doing, uh, doing politics that way. Getting but uh, I mean, I do support candidates who I like, um, but that's the extent of it. But no, I, even if I was delusional and narcissistic enough to even entertain that idea, I would not be eligible. So it's just not even something that's a fantasy. <laughs> Sparky says, all, all the money the U.S. spends trying to start a war with China could be spent working on the regulation and enforcement of free and fair trade. Yeah, that's, that's a, that's a longer conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I think it'd be interesting uh, by the way, if you got, um, Mearsheimer and Jeffrey Sachs to debate that topic on your show, because yeah. they agree completely on Ukraine, but then they have a difference on China. And I think it's very interesting. Yeah, that yeah, would they, be an interesting. They were an interesting one. They're good friends, by the way. Yeah. Despite, yeah. despite their disagreements. C. Hud says, thanks for all the info. It's hard to find truth and sense these days. Cheers, chaps. Thank you for that. David Sachs, thank you for joining us. We've gone an hour, five minutes. We really appreciate your time. You can find and follow David on Twitter X. I have the link in the description box down below, and it will be added as a pinned comment. Well, th thanks uh, to you guys for all the work that you do. I know that you work very hard. I mean, you guys put out content every day. I don't think you miss. And so, and, you know, I know you have to do a lot of research before you do those shows. So, uh, you know, I, you guys, I can tell that you guys work really hard. I really appreciate what you do. And I'm a fan of your podcast. So keep up the great work. Thank, thank you, you very much, David, David for those thank words you. and for coming on our show. <laughs> Absolutely. Anytime. Thank you very much, David. All Take right. care. Thank you guys. Wow, great show. It was. It was a very great show. He he is very clear. You know, he's a bit you can see that he's a a business ready why well, he's a successful businessman yeah. because Let's, his mind is so clear and very, very direct. Yeah. Yep. Um there's there's, there's not there's we, we have we have some oh, we have some yeah. questions to answer, but um yes. going off of what you said, yeah, I think the yeah. I think the reason he's able to to analyze the geopolitical, I mean, he 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 said it during the live stream. The reason he's able to correctly analyze the geopolitical is because he takes the approach of of analyzing businesses and start startups. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So let's just uh, get through whatever uh, exactly. uh, questions and comments we have because we do have some some more questions and comments, and we will wrap it up for this evening. For me, it's it's evening time. So um, let's see, Bartu, thank you for joining the direct community. Death Dealer 1341 says, is Poland going to war with Russia on Easter Sunday? No. They're, 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 they, they are already um, sending their troops there. There's reports that one of their generals has just been killed in Chasif I don't think they're going to go to war. Yeah. Uh, Sparky says, Dinat by Israel. Elza says, the Biden administration said that the crocus attack, it was ISIS, period. Isn't that proof enough? <laughs> Uh, it's conclusive, Punks conclusive yeah. proof. What more, more, more information do you need? Pucks McGee says, has Russia reported Ukraine war crimes to the UN ICC? No, uh, they're not part of the ICC. They don't want to have anything to do with the ICC. So, uh, which remember is indicting Putin and is coming after right. other Russians and all of that. So no, the Russians are not going to have any, any dealings with the ICC. Not, not forever, I think. Uh, Sir Muggs Game says... Tuckerville, the greatest of America, lies in her ability to repair her faults. Can she still repair her faults, or is that a bridge too far? Well, this is the great question. This mm -hmm. is the great unanswered question. I, I don't know. I, I used to be optimistic. I'm less optimistic now, but, but we'll see. Yeah. Sparky says, is Garland Nixon working with Keybridge Recovery? He's retired Maryland police, was Chesapeake Bay hovercraft pilot and his father was a local longshoreman haven't seen garland since the collapse oh no I, i'm sure garland's fine i'm sure he's okay yes i, I think i have seen him actually yeah just saying yeah uh he he, he should be on a show uh soon as well by the way uh commander crossfire says 
Putin said last month that Russia was one step away from cancer vaccines. Now the head of the medical biology agency, Vasily Lazarev, said the main remaining obstacles are regulatory and budgetary. Have you been okay, following yeah. the story? I, ha I, I saw the comment from Putin. I'll just wait and see what comes yeah. because this, this does seem a bit way out to me, to be honest. Um, Putin has been working very hard and very intensely to build up um, um, Russia's pharmaceutical industry. The, the Russian pharma, the old Soviet pharmaceutical industry completely collapsed. They're importing all their medicines from the West. And he's really, you know, wanted to build it up. And apparently they're now covered for about half of the, med the medicines that they have. But I think he's perhaps getting a bit overexcited and is anticipating um, successful products that we just don't know about yet. And I, I hope that this isn't it's a big mistake, but anyway, we'll see. Yeah. Uh, Nikos says, everything that's wrong today, whether it's Marxist wokeness in our culture or global wars, can be summed up in two words, arrogance and narcissism. Yeah. And Nikos, a follow-up to that uh, super chat, Nikos says, the West today doesn't have democracy. Our ancestors in Athens invented. What we have is oligarchy, just like Sparta. They are laughing now, saying we won. Well, I think that's probably true, actually. I mean, yeah, I, 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 I think there's a strong point being made there. Actually, we do have oligarchy, and um, we that inevitably follows when free debate is restricted. Because if you know anything at all about Athenian democracy, its most important principle was that there be completely open discussion. Yeah. Uh, one second, Alexander. Tish M says, I'll say it again. Julian is my litmus test. And let's not forget that both parties of the U.S. regime have their boot prints all over him. Assange. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. Absolutely. I mean, we. I'm sure you all know that there's been a legal decision in his case. Um, I, I, we were, we're going to do a program about it. I'm sure we are. But I, I am not happy with this decision. The high court said that he had uh, arguable grounds for appeal um from the court the earlier decision to extradite him i think he's absolutely i think that's absolutely right but then they give with one hand and they take away with the other because they're giving the american government the u.s government the biden administration in other words an opportunity to provide assurances and i i, I when that happens alarm bells start ringing loudly with me Johan, thank you for that super chat. Sparky says, or one word, smugnerance. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Sparky says, build a better world with bricks. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see here. Um, G GI1416 says, why do you think the mainstream media got the invasion day narrative at the start of the SMO some, somewhat right? I remember thinking it was fake. I thought it was. I thought it was fake, uh, um, up to pretty much the, the the last moment. I began, as I've said many times, to to think that something was really going to turn out horribly wrong at the time of the Munich Security Conference. I, I, I still have this view that they got it right because uh, they willed it. They intended it to happen at that time. There was the shelling of Donbass, which many people deny happened, but which did happen. And I think they knew perfectly well that at that point the Russians would have no real option but to intervene because that is what they always said they would do. Yeah, um, I would just say G GI1416, go to this the live stream we did yesterday with Jacques Bart. He, yeah, he, he talks with, about the, the very exactly. point that you made, Alexander. Exactly, yeah. exactly. He gets into it in, in detail as well, so yeah, just exactly. uh, check out that live stream. Um, OMG Puppy says, uncontrolled immigration may be a democratic party up, but that doesn't explain why it is also happening in Europe, UN involvement in Central America, etc. Well, indeed, yeah. Yeah. That is a good point. Uh, I, yeah, I think David touched on that as well mm. um, in his answer. On, uh, I, I should say that it is not as, we're not talking about in Europe, a tidal wave as big yet as the one in the United States. I mean, 4 million people, I believe a year, I've never heard of anything like that. Sir 
Muggs Game says a plain clothes invasion is enacted because the idea of a family wage puts all of Congress in rage. Uh, Spar Sparky says, remove Israel's economic and military aid, and they'll soon learn to get along with their neighbors or else dissolve into the region. Well, I, I think that, I mean, uh, going back to our earlier discussion, I mean, I, I, you know, when you could perhaps understand what Moshe Dayan was saying, you know, about Israel needing to be like a mad, a rabid dog that you needed to keep away from when it was first um, established, you know, from the 40s and 50s and 60s. Um, I'm not saying, by the way, that it was the right strategy even then, but there was a kind of logic to it. But now, when it's been around for a long time, for decades, it's a well-established state, do they really need to behave like that? If you behave like that, what you're doing is you're isolating yourself in your own region. I mean, you, you, you're not going to make any kind of stable relationships with anybody and i think the sooner they drop that type of strategy the better it will be for them mf71 from rumble says after the moscow terrorist attack will putin delete newland i well i i don't think so i i don't think this yeah. is his style actually i mean this is absolutely not his style um but if they do satisfy themselves that there is a Utra Ukrainian trace, they will go after the people in Ukraine. That I do think. But I don't think he will ever go after someone like Newland or any of the official people in the United States. That isn't at all uh, what what um, Putin does or what the Russians do. A a MF71, um, just remember that when it comes to, to poisoning, Putin is the world's worst poisoner. Yeah, true enough. <laughs> it's the worst. It's the worst. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Uh, Sir Bugs Game says the treasures of Sierra Russia drove the British, the French, and the Germans to madness and mm -hmm. defeat. Now the Americanos have followed suit. Mm. Well, it's it's like the it's like the treasure chest at the end of the rainbow. You try and go there, and it. You, you find that you never get there because that's what's going to happen. And it is driving them mad. I think this is more the Europeans, actually, than the Americans, in truth. I think the Americans, the neocons, have been playing a geopolitical game. The Europeans have been playing what they think of as a more neocolonial, imperial, old-style imperialist game. Bridget Hall, welcome to the Durant community. Hugh Jazz, welcome to the Durant community. Jeff Beckford, thank you for that super sticker. Ellen says, all, all else aside, when our rulers in D.C. see the tens of thousands of innocent deaths and maimed, they are funding. Is there not a bit of human conscience or guilt? I don't, I don't see it. I don't get any sense of that at all, to be honest. Yeah, I don't get a sense of guilt at all. Uh, mm. Sparky says, uh, Newland and her NZI minions don't necessarily need to work with the CIA to pull off terror attacks like the recent one. The State Department has their own spooks and affiliates, if need be. I have no doubt that if Newland had wanted to get in touch with some bad sort of people, she could do so. Uh, I think I said that recently in a program that I did, but I've, I've no doubt that can be done. They could have done it. Whether she did is, of course, another matter. I mean, I don't know. Um, I mean, this would be an extreme wild thing even for Newland to do, but then who knows? Mustafa says Europeans claiming Russia is a warmed a war machine and not going to stop on Ukraine. What do you think about this claim? No, I don't think so at all. I think that if you look at Russian history, they've been saying this ever since the 18th century. I mean, they have. You know, you follow Amer you, you follow European history. You read what people are saying about the Russians. They're always saying that the Russians are out to conquer the whole of Europe. Napoleon said it. He did. Um, and it never happens. I, I don't think the Russians are about that at all. I think what they are overwhelmingly concerned about is their own security. They have many, many things they want to do within their own country. I think they are overwhelmingly focused on that. And what they want from us is that we leave them alone, which is something we never seem to understand or want to do. Yeah. Uh, Chris H says, uh, Garland Nixon said in his last podcast with Jody Bear that with Jody Brer that he would be traveling for a week. 
Cool. Yeah. There you go. There you have it. Um, let's see here. Give me one sec. Alexander Valies. Thank you for that super sticker, Valies. And from Sir Muggs Game, bravo to the Alexes for keeping a lid on their passions while analyzing Gaza while most ran screaming into traffic. The Duran, the professionals, the Boydie and Doyle of geopolitics, if you remember the TV show. Of course I do. I remember it very well from, uh, uh, you know, long ago, the professionals back in the 1970s. It was uh, indispensable television. Thank you very much for your very kind okay. words. Uh, Sir Muggs Game says, Alexander, what about... Maba, make America British again. They seem ripe for the plucking. I, I think that um, in Britain, we have enough problems. <laughs> you don't will the United States upon us. Uh, Sparky says, Bipartisan Telecommunications Act of 1996 should be repealed. I was a phone company engineer and recognized its major problems back then, but thought I'd be it'd be gone by the time it manifested itself. Uh, I, I, David I should look at the Telecommunications yeah. Act. Should brush up a tel Telecommunications Act of 1996. It's important. Isn't yeah, that the I, Bill I think Clinton? It is. Yeah. Go on. That, I was going to say, isn't that the Bill Clinton Act? Uh, yes, Alexander I think it Sparky? is. I, <laughs> I think it is the. I think it is that act. I think it's the act which, as we know, gave the exemptions okay. to the meet to the social media companies and all right. of those things uh, or, or I do, consolidated I'm not, I'm not, the media into six comp companies companies exactly yes uh, right, and right, opened all kinds of uh, opened up all kinds of things yeah i think it is an important act but i'm, I'm not going to pretend that i know for sure yeah. uh, and, and i don't want to talk about such an important topic off the top of my head sparky says kamala drove putin over the edge at the munich security conference leading to the smo I've never forgotten that speech that she did then. I mean, I, it was absolutely wild. I mean, it was, I mean, she was absolutely intoxicated with the sort of sense of euphoria that was already there in the room. But there, she wasn't the only one. I mean, Baerbock was speaking and she was absolutely crazy. And of course, uh, Zelensky himself made one of the most astonishing speeches I've ever seen. And they were all doing it. Johnson was there, Boris Johnson too. They were all there. Alexander says, don't let Sparky fund the whole thing. Get out these cards, patriots. These guys, the Alexanders, are doing are doing God's work. Thank you, Alexander, for that. Uh, Ricardo says, mad dog strategy isn't such a good idea when one considers what is done to mad dogs. Good point. Sparky says, Israel's pumped up way beyond itself with U.S. money. Well, <laughs> I think that what needs to happen in the Middle East is for the Israelis to take a good hard look at their situation and ask themselves, what is all this money, all this war, all this fighting, all this uh, expansion of settlements? What is it actually providing them? What they need to do is to make peace and not seek an elusive victory, which simply ends in more war all the time. Yeah. Now, Samuel says, what is the current state of relations between Russia and Georgia now? It seems to me that Georgia has abandoned the idea of joining NATO. I think it has. I think this is a much better relationship. Of course, there's lots of tensions within Georgia, and there are people in Georgia who uh, would like to <laughs> return to those old policies. But the government seems stable. It seems been successful in seeing off challenges. And I think relations between Russia and Georgia are not close. I believe they still don't have diplomatic relations, but they are nonetheless able to communicate and coexist reasonably well with each other. Sarayel says Newland doesn't have to get in touch with bad people. All she needs to do is look in the mirror. That's the problem. <laughs> Thank you, Sarayel, for that. Uh, Ricardo says the U.S. can use the Ukraine uh, IS connection to walk away from Project Ukraine. Just a suggestion. I, I was thinking about that as well. Yeah, yeah, they can. They could this, do. This they were, could be a way to though. shift to pivot. Yeah. yeah, they weren't though. I mean, that's the they trouble. They'd be given opportunity after opportunity to do it. Even if this one were to come forward, they wouldn't do it. Uh, Brett Ferguson, thank you for that super chat. Uh, Valerie VV says, "Is the Russian oligarchy substantial or a leftover belief?" From the 90s, how did Putin influence this? Would love an in-depth video. 
I think the, the key thing to understand is that the Russian oligarchy never ultimately managed to get full control of Russian society. They gained control of a lot of the big um, industrial groups. But in a, in a country such as that of Russia in the 1990s, there was nothing legitimate about their ownership of all of these assets. So in the end, they were only powerful because of the fact that they had the backing at that time of the Kremlin, of Yeltsin and of the government. When power in the Kremlin changed, their weakness, their underlying weakness was exposed and they were rolled back extremely fast, much faster than I think people in the West ever, ever expected or thought they would be. Yeah, Brett says Evola was right. I think it's ride the tiger time. Yeah. Alexander, I think that's everything. I've got I've got my question, which is just the final question, and then we'll wrap it up. Yeah. Uh, in my video, I, I think I made a mistake in my video or I misinterpreted the resolution, the UN Security Council resolution. Um, and you mentioned that it is legally binding. Yeah. I read when I did my report, I said it's non-binding. I was reading a US, the US comments, which state that it's non-binding. It's definitely not enforceable or it won't be yeah. enforced unless it goes to a chapter seven. Is that this a is, correct assessment of the UN Security Council resolution legally binding to the majority? Yes, not legally, not binding to the US and difficult if not impossible to, to enforce now until it gets to a chapter seven. Yes, there is okay. a spectrum of Security Council, res of, of how Security Council resolutions can work. So if you go to the text of this resolution, now, if it had called for a immediate ceasefire, that would not have been binding because it's just a request. It calls for, if it had ordered, which you can do, by the way, a, a immediate ceasefire, that would absolutely be binding. What the word that's used is demands. 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 Instead of decide. It decides, exactly. It, it demands. Now, that, I think, 99% of lawyers, international lawyers, would say is binding, makes it binding. Um, there is a little wriggle room, and the Americans are using it. But if you go to the rest of the resolution, there is one particular paragraph that is there, which to my mind makes it conclusive that it is in fact intended to be binding. And that is the last paragraph, which is that the Security Council remains seized of the matter. Now, that is a standard clause that the Security Council uses in binding resolutions, because they say that if this, what it means is, if the resolution is not adhered to, the Security Council can return to the subject and make further decisions, which is the enforcement point that you were making. In other words, it can impose sanctions, proceed to authorise military action or do all of those things. Of course, this is where the Americans are certain to impose their veto. They will never agree to a Security Council resolution that imposes sanctions on Israel or, well, I mean, authorizing military action is out of the question. But they will never agree to that kind of resolution by the Security Council, a Chapter 7 resolution. But this is, in my opinion, opening up the way to something like that. So if this resolution is flouted, there will be more resolutions coming down the line saying that you know the israelis are non-compliant the united states will try to argue that it's not binding other states will insist that it is that as i said is the prevalent view and of course always behind it all there is the nuclear option taking it to the to the general assembly um under the uniting for peace formula okay so nigel says enforcing the he asks enforcing the resolution would a general, my final question, and then we'll wrap it up. Yeah. Uh, will the general, if, if it goes to the General Assembly and they vote on it, does that make it 
enforceable? Right. Like sanctions, etc., or like a chapter right. seven sanctions, etc. Or, right. or no? Right. The, the, uh, bear in mind, I'm not an I'm not an expert on this. Yeah, but uh, myself. And, and I know that here. There, we've got I you know here. We've got you here. There's a lot of confusion. There, I know, there's I know, a lot know, of the, confusion about the text right, in this right, in this resolution. Right. Yeah. Right. What I want to say is this: if it goes to the United Nations General Assembly, in general, you UN General Assembly resolutions are non-binding, but there is a formula created by the way by the united states in the 1950s to override soviet vetoes which is called the uniting for peace formula now i i think it needs at least a two-thirds majority of states to support this but if they if if the general assembly decides to adopt this formula and they have to agree to that and they pass a uniting for peace resolution, then I understand that they have the same kind of powers that the Security Council does. And that could involve sanctions or it could involve authorizing military action. As I understand it, when the United States got the United Nations to um, engage in the Korean War, it's not widely known, but the U.S. forces that were fighting in North Korea, or South in Korea during the Korean War, were technically the U.N. forces. That was how they were referred to. That was done through the mechanism of a Uniting for Peace resolution. Okay. Alfred, thank you for joining the direct community. Alexander, thank you for joining the direct community. Eric Hatchett, thank you for that super chat. Alexander, we are finished. Uh, thank you to everyone that joined us on this live stream. Uh, thank you to David Sachs for a fantastic uh, show. And thank you to everyone that watched us on Rockfin, Odyssey, Rumble, YouTube, the Duran.wokes.com, and of course, our amazing, awesome moderators, Valias, Zarael, uh, Tish, Tish M. Who else? Peter is with us. Uh, did I see Reckless Abandon as well in the in the chat? I'm not sure, but um, thank you to our moderators for everything that that you do, mm. Alexander. Let's uh, let's call it an evening, a night. Absolutely. Thank you to everybody. Wonderful live stream. Take care.